Good evening, I'm Benjamin Pierce, and welcome to tonight's live stream, The Fight to Clean Out Financial Corruption in Australia, a discussion with a selection of our candidates from around the country. The format for tonight's presentation will begin with uh, opening comments from Denise Braley, who will be, which will be titled, What About Regulatory Neglect in the Financial, uh, financial Sector? Following that, we'll have a question and answer session where you, the viewer, can submit questions and we'll have our candidates answer as many of those as possible. You can submit your questions via email to ask at citizensparty.org.au. And for further information on uh, our policies and the ideas that we discuss in tonight's show, visit our website, citizensparty.org.au. And uh, just to note that there will be future live streams sometime after, uh, after the Easter break. Stay tuned for further announcements about those. Now I'll turn to introducing our candidates for tonight's show. We have Denise Braley, our, one of our Senate candidates for WA. We have Robert Barwick and Craig Isherwood, our two Senate candidates for Victoria. We also have Kingsley Liu and Anne Lawler, who are, who are our Senate candidates for New South Wales. And also joining us is one of our lower house candidates for the Victorian seat of Nichols, that is Jeff Davey. So uh, again, any questions that you have for our candidates tonight, send them through to ask at citizensparty.org Dot au. And otherwise, I will hand it over to Denise Braley for her opening remarks. Thank you, Denise. Good evening, everybody. And uh, I'm very happy to be here. Um, and the discussions I'm going to raise tonight are on white collar crime in Australia, because I've often been talking about this. That unfortunately, this nation is always plagued by white collar crime. And if I may, I'll quote the CEO, um, or the chairman of ASIC, our regulator, uh, from five years ago, saying uh, Australia is the white collar crime capital of the world. The reason being, and I will discuss it in late, a little later on, but is policies. If a government has a policy that we have laws to protect consumers, but we don't want to spend the money and we don't want to use them, then you will have problems of the sort that I am uh, explaining to that tonight. So white collar crime is targeting the elderly. We know that. We, we've been saying that for a long time now. And that the retirement monies of these people, uh, when they reach a certain age, uh, they're immediately asked to... Um, part with that money in ways they couldn't even think about. I want to make the big point in the very beginning. If these elderly people were mugged in the street and there was $200 stolen from them, police would arrive in droves and there would be immediately uh, an investigation taken up. But if they're mugged by white collar criminals of $300,000 to $400,000 per person, then we're not getting anything other than giving an infringement notice to those that have taken to uh, using that form of fundraising to better their own nests and line their own pockets. The state government says, no, go to ASIC. We're not going to look after you. ASIC, we have just been saying over and over again on the internet and everywhere else, is a dead duck. There's no point in going there for consumer protection or even a proper investigation. They don't even take their records back to more than two years so they can actually suggest that they've got no records of certain things happening. And how we found that out was in the recent Senate inquiry into Sterling First. So I'll talk a little bit in the beginning about Sterling First and 100 elderly couples that are the epitome, I believe, of an example of what is wrong with this country at the moment, not finding that consumer protection matters, because it does. 
ASIC say there's no physical harm done, we shall issue a fine. The ASIC controlled by the federal government policies, are, are their buyer beware policies, caveat emptor, they often remember, refer to that. And that's the problem. If the actual public servants are told, this is buyer beware, you can't handle those cases, then there's more of the same from culprits, and I'll describe them shortly. The ASIC duties are that of a librarian currently. They're, they're waste management. Get rid of the people and get rid of the bodies, and we don't have to look at anything. The Sterling First is a prime example of how not to handle a, a fairly small Ponzi. It's, it's only 18 million. The first criticism I have of this, this could have been solved three years ago instead of dragging these elderly people through a, a series of problems, including being thrown out into the street, including having to be forced to couch surf over the last few years, uh, last three years in particular. So anyone that signed up for a mortgage or invested in Ponzi co companies know where I'm coming from. They know this experience with ASIC has been something that really is a problem. So soon people realize they're part of a finance and banking scam. They complain to ASIC and they find there's no effective investigations. They know there's financial fraud. They understand when they get together then that they've all been charged with the same bus and treated in the same disgraceful way where their life savings have disappeared. These Ponzi scams are run by the developers. So the banks are at the bottom of all this with mortgage uh, uh, problems. And so people are enticed into these properties as landlords, and they have then problems with the loans from the banks. Next, you've got retirees to be able to come along and get every cent they possess, their entire life savings, into a scheme where they're not just losing $10,000, they're losing significant amounts of money. And the consequences are often financial wipeout, as they are in this case. So the scams that we've been looking at wipe out the inheritances of the next generation from entering the property market. The grand theft promotes a lifetime of poverty and homelessness. And this is why sterling is so important. They're in a desperate situation. They urgently need the 18 million that was stolen repaid back to them. It cannot come from the directors because they've all cried poverty. And so therefore ASIC is to blame because it knew about this scam, knew about the actual directors in 2015 and knew the record of these directors was back to West Point and earlier scams in the past, multiple scams. So these people own their own homes. They were high profile. Uh, they, were, they were promoted by high profile people, sportsmen and women. We've seen this before. I could name you a whole list of big names as promoters and radio personalities going back 20 years that have decided to pro promote these types of schemes, schemes not knowing that there was a, a sting there that people would lose their life savings. So we're not blaming the promoters, but their, their profile, their name is used as though this gives a scam, a Ponzi scam integrity, which it never deserved. But more than that, Sterling first is all about what's wrong with our slack regulatory system. And that's why you'll hear me say a bit about that. So when I told you something like this, we hands out parking tickets and it admitted that in the inquiry, saying, oh, it's working very well. We call them infringement notices. What, for stealing 18 million? I mean, it's just a disgrace that this is still continuing. The Ponzi scam aided by the major banks, they're all in there, CBA, Macquarie and other funders were there in the initial stages to put these things in place. The developers created new blocks of land and they were building mini homes. The Sterling First people were coaxed into becoming tenants for life, and they were told to sell their homes, choose a mini home. They found there were similar aged neighbours in the in uh, next door and so on in the same street. They were thinking it's safe and secure. 
they immediately paid all the proceeds of the sale of their homes into a trust. But the trust wasn't set up in the way it should have been in terms of regulatory um, restrictions. No, it was just put in bank accounts and the money disappeared within 24 hours. Of course it did. So three days after parting with their money, they meet with a rep with $10,000 commission going to the salesman. And the actual, they actually said there's no fees in this, meaning no fees for uh, like a retirement village, but yet they got stung. Each person in this scam got stung an extra $20,000 fee because that was to also cover the costs of the actual um, uh, uh, commissions to be paid. So they sign up a five-year lease, but there were eight leases. So that's where the story came in that, that made them interested in the first place because they're, they're, um, they were told they would be there till 2057, 2057, 58, 59, whenever they joined, 40 years. They were safe and secure to death do you part. And then the money that they put in would then be paid back to their beneficiaries of their will. Of course, that never happened. The whole money was spent within a day. So they told the, these people, start packing. This is good. Here are your keys. Start moving in. Meet your neighbors. And they did all that. They, they were then asked months later, would they like to put $10,000 cash investment in the company if they had that left in the bank account, which these people would have known how much they had left. Some of them fell for it. Many didn't. But there was more money ripped off of certain people even later on. They were mil this company was milking the customers for all they had left. After a two-year battle, after the collapse, which was in uh, 2000, and it really started faltering. ASIC knew it was faltering in 2017. It actually collapsed in May 2019 because ASIC allowed it to continue. It knew about this in 2015 and filed it in not, no need to bother file. The elderly couples were caught then between the, the legal arguments of the lawyers, the federal lawyers who deem these people to be private investors, according to ASIC. They weren't investors. They've never invested in their life. They didn't even know what a PDS was. ASIC helped these directors with their PDS. The lawyers for ASIC helped the directors, not the customers, but the PDS was never given to these people to 21 days after they moved into their new home. So they just thought it was a brochure and put it in the cupboard because that's what they were told to do. Now, after a two year battle from 2019 onwards, the courts ruled in favor of the landlord. What we didn't know, and yet we were told in the beginning by Tenancy WA, that the tenancy agreements were safe. They were covered under the Residential Tenancy Act, but that wasn't true. It was a rewa logo. They were rewa leases, but the rewa leases have been altered to put tricky uh, other wording in to alter what the uh, protections were under this lease, which took it immediately outside the protection of the retiree, uh, the, uh, the Rental Tenancy Act. So we have an act to protect them, but the leases took them outside that protection and they lost in court. So then of course the landlords who were also suffering, they had to go and ask their landlords and kick out 86 to 93 year olds. That's a disgrace. How can we, we, how can we allow that in Australia? I'd like every Australian to put their hand up as to whether they think that's okay, because I don't. So while we went on with the legal arguments, and then ASIC suggested it was an MIS scheme, well, it might have been, but under court law, but they weren't going to look up either. So the state lawyers were blaming the federal lawyers, and back it went again between ASIC and Demers. So at the, the end of the day, it didn't matter what the sterling people tried to do, they were learning as they go all these problems. 
the elderly were being kicked out of the house and the elderly people ended up couch surfing with relatives. That's still going on at the moment. So the politicians chose not to see the buyer beware caveat emptor as a problem. The federal government um, ignored this problem. And, and to me, it's a despicable point of view. It's really like saying, you deserve what you get, you silly old moot. Well, I'm not happy with that. And I hope you're not either. We've seen it before. West Point, and I mention that because two of the directors were involved in West Point, which was 680 million disappeared out of retirees' pockets, which I first pointed out in 2000 to the commissioner. Trio Capital, in court, there's a list of 12 that I had in 2004 and met with ASIC enforcement director and the deputy chair and said, what are we doing about this? And they said, oh, yes, Denise, it's falling. Um, but we've got a list of 100 Ponzi's and we're concerned. But by the time Mr. Deloiso came along in 2007, he at least said, no, Denise, we've got a list of two, uh, uh, 1,000 Ponzi's. And actually got so annoyed, he actually printed all these thousand names of companies in the future that he was, he was expecting to collapse. And that happened, uh, I think, around 2008-9. Politics is not taught in schools. So I was speaking to the deputy chair in 2005, and he suggested, oh, Denise, you don't understand these policies. I said, yes, I do, Jeremy. I want you to tell me. Are you following your policies or are you following uh, federal parliament? And he nodded towards Cam. That was my answer. I knew that anyway, he knew it, I knew it. We need small parties to look at these big issues because we're getting nowhere. After all these years, I'm fed up with Liberal and Labour. I'm fed up with them voting in the Senate on party lines. Fed up, if you look at all the senators and their record, of voting, it will always be along party lines. There has to be a bit of uh, honesty about how we treat what we're doing in Parliament. And I believe this can be achieved through the Citizen Party, I honestly do. My quest is to keep the bastards honest, and that's in the beginning. And that was also the quest, remember, of, um, uh, uh, of the Democrats years ago. But now the nation needs more than that. It needs professional opinions, academics, people with higher education to tackle, tackle this particular paucity of knowledge in Australia. Citizens Party have achieved this standard over 37 years of lobbying for change in so many important areas of our expertise and discourse. To me, the best place to start is the Senate. Good, there's good senators in there but they're voting on party lines. It's hopeless outcomes, not necessarily in the best interests of consumers. We need citizens to join hands and say, enough is enough of bending the rules to enable the elitist crooks to rip off the elderly. And I'm fed up with the privilege through a uh, few ripping off the rest of it. And I'll let you into a little secret. The mates of the directors of Sterling First, I'm not gonna name them here, I'm not that silly but they were the highest names, well-known names, in Australian business boardrooms, Jaws would drop. I am running with pride as an endorsed candidate by the Senate of the Australian uh, Citizens Party in Western Australia. If you have relatives in West Australia, please ask them to support us. Our Senate is a house of review. It's supposed to be your eyes and ears as to what the lower house is doing. And each state, I'll, I explain this because not a lot of people know this, each state has 12 senators. Every three years, six senators are elected for a six year term. So citizens party are fielding at least two senators in every state and territory. Please back them all up. They're very, very good people. And I've certainly been speaking to a number. There are lawyers, economists, accountants, a powerhouse of knowledge and finance and experience. And that impresses me. It really does, rather than talking to the ASIC gods. My goodness me, there's a big thing there. As a citizen, if you want the truth on a variety of very important subjects and issues, then grow with this knowledge. We are actually working for the common good. And my first task will be, of course, to clean up the regulatory system. 
Uh, banks are running the nation, we know that. So why are no investigations being taken by us? Well, it's free market policies. You know, it's free for all. There's been 24 years of virtually no action in this space, no serious consumer protection. The ASIC budget set by Treasury, there's only an allocation of 450 million, I wish. But that 450 million is spent purely on running seven offices of nothingness for ASIC. That's all it does, nothing. Ponzi's, they're a librarian. They look after uh, certain uh, investment uh, uh, files, yes. But did you know that if you sign for a business, I reported this in 1998, you can have six business names all in 10 dates of birth for its directors. You can do that today. I'll show you how to do it. The Ponzi scam is still connected with bankers, property uh, masters, real estate developers, and a lot of tries in the moment. The policies that have been adopted by the federal government have crippled consumer protection in Australia and design. And, and as it is fundamentally and intentionally flawed, uh, flawed, investigators know who the main part, players are in the Ponzi scams whenever I've spoken to them. They say, oh, not this guy again. And the blame is always passed on to the victims. Notice that, buyer beware, silly old moo. Got yourself in a bit of trouble, have we done? Asset high profile mates are given a green light. They're big players. And yet we say white collar crime doesn't matter. They didn't hurt anybody. What rot is that? If it was your parents, would you be happy? Well, maybe you would, I don't know. But anyway, the non-compliance with our laws passed by the lower house and in the parliament and the Senate are not, uh, are not conducive to help, uh, bringing about a result in this unless it's really with heart uh, in place to do that well. I gave a message one time to my late mother. If a decent look well-dressed person slam the, uh, walk down your garden path, slam the door in the face, they're out to steal your home. Conversely, a rough character walking down your garden path, well, you might as well let him in. He just wants a few change, bits of change in your purse, but they're not there, there to steal the home that you worked 30 years of your life to achieve. Now, the Prime Minister has ignored for years. These people have most of them probably treasury. They all ignored the issue of grand ethics criminals. The chairman of the chairman of ASIC and we cannot help you. But ASIC did assist the justice. So where's the justice in that? The Australian farmers have also been approached with to manage investment schemes, and I know a bit about that. I was asked by Malcolm Roberts to help him with the primary producers inquiry by being a witness to that. And years earlier, in the banking post GFC inquiry, I've been to numerous inquiries saying the same thing over and again. The Prime Minister is still ignoring the problem of white collar crime. He wants an impotent regulator. It suits his purpose, it's looking after his mate. My advice, please vote for the Citizen Party in the Senate. Place Liberals last, place Labour second last in the Senate. And whatever you do in the lower house, well, there's certain, um, there, sorry, there are certain um, uh, Citizens Party uh, representatives that will go uh, into the election as lower house candidates. So look at the website. For that. The system needs changing. We need a complete policy overhaul. Thanks, Denise. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for that presentation, Denise. And we will begin the questions, uh, keeping it on that subject. Our first question tonight comes from Kate in New South Wales. From what I'm hearing, financial corruption in Australia is a major problem. And rather than ASIC ensuring corporations are working in the yeah. best interests of people and the economy, it appears to be actually turning a blind eye, even perpetuating white-collar crime. Denise Braley's account of the Sterling First Group and the elderly victims now being evicted from their homes 
paints a very sinister picture, indicating either really poor regulatory standards or complicity in Sterling's targeting of the vulnerable. My question is, who regulates the regulators? Was ASIC asleep at the wheel? It is hard to believe they did not know what was going on. What mechanisms exist to have ASIC overhauled? Or, as Dennis from Brisbane says, how do we drain the swamp? All right, who, who would like to start that one? Jeff, got your hand up there. Unmute. Make sure you're on mute, yeah. Jeff. Yep. Can yep. you hear me? You're on. Um, yeah. Uh, All right, just a minute. This is working. Uh, yes, they can hear you, Denise. Yep. Uh, just stand by for Denise, Jeff. Are you muted, Denise? Is that all right? Yeah. Okay. The, the main issue here is that who regulates the regulators? The regulators are regulated by policy, and that's the message I'm getting out, because most people, there's a lot of people in Australia, apart from academics that deal with this all the time, but the average person out there doesn't understand that if ASIC's the regulator, it is under, it's supposed to be acting autonomous, but it is not acting by proof of the last 20, 30 years. It's not acting uh, autonomous at all. It's only, as, as the deputy chair told me, it, it's, it's acting on the policy of the federal government. So the only way you could get ASIC to move a muscle is uh, right to, which we've done on many occasions, to the Prime Minister and the Treasurer. And particularly the Treasurer, because the Treasurer is the one um, in contact with ASIC. Okay, Jeff, your hand is up. You can speak. Yeah, can you hear me all right? Yes. Yeah, I uh, just want to go through something that the Treasurer said, uh, it's a scathing assessment of conduct driven by greed and behaviour that was in breach of existing law and fell well below community expectations. My message to the financial sector today is that this conduct must end. Josh Frydenberg said that in response to the Royal Banking Commission. Uh, what's happened since then? Well, Mr. Freinberg put Nicholas Bohr in as the regulator to watch over the regulators. He's the chairman of the Financial Regulator Assessment Authority, FRAA. And since that time, according to the ABC back, background briefing, the biggest banking scandal that you've ever, that you haven't heard of, Nicholas Bohr has been named as a man of interest in a financial scam that was driven by greed. <laughs> and uh, through the German government, they're, they're uh, doing a, uh, an assessment of how much money has been taken from the German government and the German people. And they believe it's something in the order of $80 billion from banks all over the world, including Macquarie, which Nicholas Moore was CEO of at the time. Thank you. Robbie, would you like to add something? Yeah, further to what uh, Denise said on the question of policy, this, uh, we've written a series of articles in our publication, the Australian Alert Service in the last few months about the evolution of those policies. And for all intents and purposes, um, for what Australians are experiencing now, you can take it back to two financial system inquiries. The first one was the Campbell inquiry that was handed down its report in 1982. And that ushered in the era that we call neoliberalism. And it was the idea that um, the free market should reign and deregulation swept through the economy. 
and every aspect, especially of the financial system. Um, and from then on, the banks were allowed to self-regulate. Um, and in fact, to this day, the only, um, in terms of banking, the only form of regulation on the banks is what the Australian Prudential Regulation Authority imposes in the form of capital requirements for the banks and their, voluntarily, their voluntary um, accordance with a code of conduct that they write for themselves. And that's, that's not enforceable. Um, and that's the, this is the state of financial regulation in Australia. And the second inquiry was the uh, Wallace inquiry in 1988, and that, sorry, 1998. And that, that really gave us the modern ASIC as we know it today, um, where before that, the Australian Securities Commission was a lot more proactive in actually assessing the products that, that financial firms offered. After that, it was caveat emptor, justified by a philosophy that, that ASIC admitted to in uh, 2014 hearings in Parliament, that it is governed by its regulations governed by a philosophy. And that philosophy is called the efficient markets theory, which is basically the idea the markets can't be wrong. The problem is the 2008 global financial crisis had proved that the markets can be dead wrong and the so-called efficient markets theory that, that people had been imbibing on for 30 years was rubbish. The markets can massively be, can be massively wrong. Um, yet this is the, the, the philosophy behind ASIC's form of uh, regulation. Basically, it, mean, it says that if you have some kind of um, scheme that people get ripped off in, then that will be made, the, the whole country will be, will be aware of that and they will naturally educate themselves, ordinary people educate themselves and stay away from those sort of schemes in the future. And that is so naive, it's not funny, right? They, um, uh, they know that. They know that, they know this has been not, that, that uh, they're, the most of the people in Australia are not sophisticated investors, that if you, if you have that kind of system, you are just encouraging white collar criminals to come up with more and more creative ways to rip people off. And, um, but they don't have to take responsibility for it because of caveat emptor. And why we um, paid attention to what, why the Citizens Party paid attention to the fight Denise Braley was involved in in Western Australia with Sterling is because we noted in that case that whereas there's hun there are literally hundreds of thousands of uh, financial victims around Australia, there's, 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 there's 200,000 financial victims of just Ponzi schemes just since 2008 that have lost $40 billion. There is thousands and thousands, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands or more of people who've been ripped off on mortgages. Um, there's, and there's stacks more with insurance and all sorts of problems, right? Um, but in the case of uh, Sterling, what we were able to achieve was a Senate inquiry into a, yes, an, an admittedly small scheme, but one where you cannot in all conscience stand by and let those victims be evicted because they're elderly people and they don't have an alternative. So you, you, you have to address it somehow. The, they were not victims of their stupidity because in, in, the, in the normal sense of the term because um, they did not invest. ASIC knew they'd been sucked into something that they didn't know they'd been sucked into because they did not invest. All they did is prepay their rent uh, for the rest of their life. And yet ASIC had information they didn't have. And if ASIC had information they didn't have and had received repeated complaints from even from in, inside ASIC as to how dodgy this operation was, knowing that the victims were vulnerable elderly people and did nothing, sat on its hands for years and years and years and did nothing, then this one case is emblematic of how um, dysfunctional and unfit for purpose ASIC actually is. And so we need to use this case to force ASIC to compensate or the government on ASIC's behalf to compensate. And if the government has to compensate, it then has to acknowledge it has to change ASIC. And if, it, if we can acknowledge it has to change ASIC, caveat emptor, the efficient markets theory all has to go and then you can begin to, to drain the swamp. But one final point, 
that I want to make, and this is quite important, it's why it's in the Citizens Party's fighting platform. Just say we achieve everything we want to achieve in this regard in terms of a total overhaul of ASIC and a better system of financial regulation in Australia. We cannot move on as a country until we look at this massive pile of financial victims and address every case. There, 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 must, there has to be some kind of um, truth and reconciliation type commission like South Africa went through after apartheid because there's so, this is such a systemic problem in Australia. We can't just say, oh, yeah, look, we had a Royal Commission. Yeah, we've, we've, we've um, brought in a few changes. Let's move on. No, no, no. Billions and billions and billions of dollars will have to be paid out to lots and lots and lots of financial victims in Australia. And the whole country has to own up to that reality because it would be unjust not to. We can't say, oh, well, let's just draw a line and move on. No. And the citizens, that's why the Citizens Party is calling for full compensation for financial victims and starting with the Sterling First ones. Okay. Um, well, Robbie, you alluded to uh, some of the consequences there of uh, compensating the victims, which absolutely should be addressed. There's been two questions submitted from viewers on the subject of compensation. Janet from Brisbane is referring to point eight of our 15-point uh, campaign platform, full compensation for financial victims. She says the first word is compel. Compel the banks and other financial institutions to fully compensate all of their financial victims, including the tens of thousands of cases from decades before the 2018 Banking Royal Commission. It seems like a big ask. So my question is, how do you compel them? And um, just to add to that, Kate, who asked the last question, uh, followed on in this manner. Uh, asking how quickly can the Sterling victims be compensated. I think it's important they be compensated immediately. They are elderly and were obviously taking advantage of. Does the government have the power to compensate them immediately? If the election is called and the government goes into caretaker mode, what would happen regarding compensation? Uh, I'll take the last question first. Uh, the government absolutely does have the power to compensate the victims uh, immediately. Um, we have called for the government to make an act of grace payment through the finance department to compensate these victims, owning up to the fact that it sets the policy for ASIC and therefore is responsible for ASIC's failures in this regard. And on that basis, they should compensate it to compensate the victims and they could do it immediately. They could look at this case, look at all the circumstances of the case, including the fact that the victims are elderly and vulnerable and, and 20 of them um, have already died and a lot of them have chronic illness and terminal illness, et cetera, and they all face eviction and homelessness and end it straight away, right? And it's, 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 a, it's a, a drop in the bucket um, in terms of the amount of money involved, $18 million plus interest plus expenses. So that, that, that can easily be done. Um, in terms of uh, uh, compelling, <laughs> that's a great word, uh, yeah, it's called legislation. And the government must legislate that a, a system much better than the one now. So at the moment, they're, they're trying to set up a system called the Compensation Scheme of Last Resort. It's a dog's breakfast. It is not fit for purpose at all. Um, even it, it, it's, it itself is an example of how this government has no sincerity whatsoever because Justice uh, Hayne, Kenneth Hayne, caught the Royal Commissioner from, into banking, called for this compensation scheme but he set parameters that already would have made it much bigger than it already is. The, the government, when they came up with the scheme, decided to exclude all managed investment schemes. And that just made it, that, that, that excludes most financial victims in Australia straight away. Anyway, there's a push to change that and enlarge this, the compensation scheme, which would be great. It should be done. That's all fine. But then you've got another problem, which is the way it's structured is the, the scheme is adjudicated by an agency called AFCA, the Australian Financial Complaints Authority, which is the new um, financial ombudsman scheme. And these, these F FOS, FOS and AFCA, these are four letter words to financial victims. I, ever since I started talking to financial victims and talking to uh, Denise, and I would hear these terms, FOS, and then later AFCA, 
they they come out of their their uh, mouths like curse words, right? And every victim has the same experience with these agencies. That's that system has to go, and you're going to have to have a much more um, uh, intentional system of of um, uh, compensation. And if the compelling requires this, which is which we've called for before, the government to front load the funds and get it back off the banks through a levy and, and the insurance companies and everyone involved that, that owes money in this area, get it back from in a levy so that the justice can actually be timely, right, as well, because these people have already been waiting a long time for compensation, then they should do that, right? And the government can do, set up a system, the government could set up a system like this quite easily. That's why it's the government. Okay, um, let's go back to the regulators uh, and specifically the FOSS. Uh, we have a question from Daryl Nolch, uh, economic, from Economic and Risk Assessment Reviews. He's a member of the Association of Corporate Investigators and International Association of Risk and Compliance Professionals. He asks, do the bills for a federal anti-corruption commission supported by Helen Haynes of Indi and Simon Holmes Accord's Teal Independence, empower the Commission to award compensation to victims so as to avoid the situation that victims need to find expensive class action lawyers who are willing to take on the establishment, empower investigations into the backroom lobbying by bankers to reinvent or rebadge the financial Ombudsman Service, FOS, and empower investigations into companies like the FOS and into revolving doors between state and federal regulatory bodies and corporations that denied there was any need for royal commissions and then claimed they were unaware of the scandals despite people like Denise Braley sending a truck full of letters to places like ASIC. Um, maybe Den Denise would like to... Uh help answer this question. I'll, I'll just say quickly, I did have a look at the, the legislation that's been put up, but only uh, briefly. Um, it does, I, I, I would say it doesn't provide for that kind of uh, compensation. Um, whether it should or not, I mean, perhaps it should. I mean, the, you know, this, the, these integrity commissions are supposed to have the, the, the powers of royal commissions. So um, perhaps it should. Uh, and cert but certainly what it should look at is is this uh, uh, phenomenon like how a, a FOS used to work and then rebadge it into Africa and how these things are private companies and they, they, um, they're structured in a certain way that they have this governance that's outside of the reach of parliament? Because, for instance, parliament can't even call the AFCA or FOS before that into um, uh, Senate estimates to ask them questions. They're exempt from freedom of information requests, et cetera. And these, this is incredibly dodgy. It should never have been allowed. Um, so that legislation should, in principle, allow an integrity commission to absolutely look at that. I'm just not sure if the, at the moment the way this legislation that they're, trying, they're proposing, I'm not sure if it does that or not. Uh, and have we lost? I was we're hoping lost. Denise Braley would say something, but we might have lost her. Yeah. Looks like we've lost uh, Denise there for the moment. Uh, were there any other comments on uh, Anne? You've got your hand up. Yeah, I'd just like to make the point that it's my understand. Uh, my understanding is that before we went down the path of the Campbell report and the ten years later the Martin um, Commission, the the system was regulated so that the interests of the people were looked after. There wasn't a need to have these, um, you know, the Ombudsman and the and AFCA and FOSS and these organisations set up to deal with complaints because there wasn't the complaints. The, the system was regulated. Um, the banks worked as they should for the interests of the, of the country. So, um, yeah, I just want to make that point. That's why we need to regulate the banks again. That's why we've got a policy for a public banking system, infrastructure bank, and a national development bank. So, um, 
the other thing is that, you know, people were looked after because they had pensions and they weren't out there trying to raise money to be able to fund their retirements. And, you know, it, it was a whole lot more um, secure system until we went down this path, which is caveat emptor. You know, it's like we, we're out there in the jungle and you've got to try and look after yourself, fend for yourself. And these so-called regulators are, are not there to look after the people. They're there to look after the ones that are actually preying on the people. Craig. Hopefully you can hear me okay. It's the first time I've spoken tonight. Um, wanted to pick up on a point that Denise made, which I think is a crucial point, given that this is a political forum, and a political discussion, and that is that when we're talking about political corruption, we're talking about the policies that are in, the, the, the political parties, the political structures are in place, playing a major, major role, if not the role, on whether, uh, or whether financial corruption is dealt with. And I want to just go back into history for a bit, because the problem is a lot of people think that there's that you have to come up with new solutions to problems that we're facing today. When throughout history, there's always plenty of examples of how it's dealt with in the past. You know, financial corruption is not you. And we had the Great Depression, remember, in the United States in particular, where we didn't have so much here in Australia because we had a depression, but we didn't have the all the banks literally foreclosing and shutting down and disappearing like they had in the United States. Now, in 1933, in March of 1933, you had Franklin Roosevelt come to power on the 4th of March 1933, he was sworn in. The day before that, 49 out of the 50 states had had bank holidays, they shut the banking system down almost completely, so there was no access to the banking system. But before that, in 1932, there was a commission, uh, it became known as the Pecora Commission, and it was trying to seek out and so source the, re the real basis for corruption in the banking system, but it actually had completely failed all the way through into January of uh, 1933. And the uh, people that were put in charge of prosecuting or trying to prosecute the banks actually gave up. There was at one point there, the uh, chairman of the committee, that was the, this, this investigative committee, had approached five other lawyers to run a special prosecutors against the banking system. And finally, you know, no one would step up until they approached this guy by the name of Ferdinand Pecora. Now he has a history of a thousand successful prosecutions. He had a photographic memory. He had an attention to detail and he was an absolute dynamo when it comes to chasing down corruption. He succeeded in, he was appointed on the 24th of January, 1933, and it was about six weeks before this whole entire process was to be shut down. And the banks were looking towards, oh, good, this thing could be over, this thing could be over. But it wasn't over because Ferdinand Pecora wanted to have more hearings. And at that hearing, he actually succeeded for the first time in a long, long time to have one of the key bankers in the United States, JP Jack Morgan from JP Morgan and so forth, put on the stand. He hadn't been in the public for 20 years and Pecora pestered and pestered and pestered this guy and he, he used every uh, method, uh, prosecutorial, prosecutorial style of, um, uh, of trying to get at the truth possible that finally JP Morgan blurted out that he hadn't paid any taxes. This is the richest man in the United States, hadn't paid any taxes in 1930, 1931 and 1932. And when that was published all over the news, all hell broke loose for the bankers because they realised they were losing the trust of the public. They were losing their, their sense of, uh, you know, being able to hide. And um, that's what uh, actually J.P. Morgan, uh, Ferdinand Pecora said of the, the bankers of his time. They hide behind litigation and darkness, right? So not much, not, not much has changed. But the key point to, to what was... Um, uh, the success of the Pecora Commission and for Ferdinand Pecora to go after these people was the fact that he had the backing of Franklin Roosevelt. And the highest presidential, you know, the, the highest political uh, uh, seat in the land gave the backing to a New York state prosecutor to go after the banks. Because, uh, as he said, as Franklin Roosevelt said, 
on the, the day of his inauguration, there is nothing to fear but fear itself. And he was talking about coming up with real, real, real um, solutions. And because the banking elites were so, seemed to be so disgusting in the eyes of the public, Roosevelt was able to, to, to um, uh, institute the Glass-Steagall Act of 1933 which saw the separation out of the legitimate banking, the necessary banking system to the whole speculative side of the banking system that had created the Great Depression in the first place. So it comes back to political support. And if people absent themselves from the political support, and the Labor Party and the Liberal Parties love to tell you, oh, don't worry about it, we'll look after it, we'll leave, just leave it to us, you know, we'll do it, don't worry about it. They... People have got used to the idea that they don't have to do anything in this political system that we have here in Australia. Whereas the most powerful thing is to pick up that phone or go and see or do whatever you can to make sure your local member, your MPs know what they have to know. Now, the problem is with MPs is they're very busy, right? There's no excuse, but they are very, they are very busy. So if an important issue comes up, like we, what we're talking about with Sterling First, we have to make it our business to make sure that every single politician in this country that's in that parliament knows what has to be done, knows that this issue is there. Because some of them will thank you for it and realise, oh, gee, I didn't know that. Wow. Right? And there's examples of that you know, from our various mobilisations in the past where we've gone and actually introduced uh, information to members of parliament that then have acted within their system, their two-party system, to do as much as they possibly can. So, you know, a lot, of, uh, a lot of people say, well, you know, what, what, what good does it do just calling my local you know, uh, politician? You know, I mean, they're part of the system. They are part of the system, but they're also able to uh, make indiv individual and independent comments. Like, for example, the recent senator that just stood up and blasted, uh, 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 you know, the prime minister of this country as being a bully, right? I mean, this is pretty hilarious stuff because we know what it's like after looking at Christine Holgate. So the key is here is the political action, the political support. If you've got the political support, you can have the inquiries and you can uncover this, but then you've got to follow on with the action of cleaning it up. And this idea of compensation for all financial victims is part of the process. You can't just have glorified investigations without actually accepting responsibility for the messes that have been made. Okay, um, I've just been advised as well that Denise has uh, dropped out and will not be joining us for the rest of the night. Any of our viewers who would like to see a smoother uh, performance in future, jump on our website, check out our policies about national banking and infrastructure construction, and uh, you know we can avoid that in the future. I did, just before moving on, um, there were one additional question has just come in on this subject. Perhaps it can be handled quickly. Um, uh, perhaps, Robbie, you might know, given your interactions with uh, the Parliament over the last couple of years. But uh, Sylvia is asking, has either major party shown interest in the sterling rort and in looking after the elderly people? Well... I wouldn't say generally they've shown interest in looking after the elderly people. Look at the state of aged care in Australia. It's, it's appalling. Uh, in terms of sterling, yes, we have forced them to show quite a bit of interest. This was a large inquiry for a small Ponzi, a smallish collapse. You know, $18 million is not a lot. I mean, it's a lot for the victims, but it's not a lot in, in, as far as these schemes go. But, but we forced the, uh, the parliament to pay attention. Of the parliamentarians who did pay attention from all parties, they were suitably shocked. Um, it, it made their jaws drop. And you can you could see that in the hearings. Uh, unfortunately, in the final report, the, uh, the Labor Party's recommendations were impotent. The Liberal Party's recommendations were outrageous. They were... Uh, their callous disregard for these victims was shocking. I'll take this opportunity to denounce Liberal Party Senator Paul Scar because he played an excellent role in the hearings, truly excellent. You could tell by his reactions to what he was hearing how shocked he was at how these people had been hung out to dry 
Yet in the final report, he put his name to the Liberal Party and a Liberal Party ideological position that the bottom line was no compensation for these victims. And he would have, that's that's the that's the epitome of towing the line, which Denise was talking about in, in the opening remarks. It was disgusting. I hope he doesn't, I hope he can't lose, he can't sleep at night, that man, because I know he knows the truth because I watched his performance in the hearings. Uh, the only the only senator who called for actual immediate compensation was one nation senator Malcolm Roberts, and I'm sure the Greens would would um, uh, likely support that as well. Uh, in this last week, we've been um, flooding Parliament with calls for both parties to commit to compensation for the victims. Uh, they have there's been quite a lot of reception to that call from the Labor Party. They're promising some kind of an announcement soon. We'll see how that goes. Um, we do, we shouldn't get ahead of ourselves. You know, you, we do have to wait and see, um, but certainly they're responding to the pressure. So let's see how that plays out. We will keep the pressure on. Okay, uh, Kingsley, you have something you'd like to add. Hey. To get confidence back in the regulator, clearly we do need some way of compensating victims. It would help restore a, a very, uh, an incredible imbalance in the system. I've been fighting cases for retirement, uh, residents of retirement villages. And it, it seems like that's the only way to go and get uh, compensation is to go to a court and fight a two year court case. We fought one case for two years. It'll probably come out as a, a key landmark decision by we get by the time we get through it. But it's taken an enormous amount of effort and it's taken a team of lawyers to work without any funding uh, uh, from these aged care residents. What we what the best we've got so far is to get a ruling that they've got the right to stay in their village and not pay increased rent because that's what's happened. The land was stolen underneath their feet. So when it comes to seniors living, uh, there's a great deal of work to be done. And ASIC, with its very limited powers, and that's mainly because they've got budgety, budgetary restraints, they're just left to do a lot of optics in being seen to carry out uh, enforcement and, 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 and get restitution. But it's terribly limited because they are a toothless tiger. And that's how the world sees them out there in the industry. Okay. Um, well, there are many aspects of cleaning out financial corruption that we need to cover. I think it's uh, timely to move on to a related matters not too far removed in the form of the housing market um, or the housing bubble. There's, uh, we have a question here from David of New South Wales. As I understand it, both major parties have announced policies that will further inflate the real estate bubble by subsidising first home buyers. Is this good policy? Young people desperate to own their own home will be saddled with mortgages that many are likely to default on down the line. Why doesn't APRA, the financial regulator, step in and stop the banks from lending to marginal borrowers? Isn't this what happened in the US, which led to the global financial crisis? Who audits the big banks? Who audits APRA? How can this be sustainable for the banks to hold so much of their assets in mortgages and risky mortgages at that? Does the problem exist because of the politicians, APRA, the banks, or the bank's auditors, or a combination of all? <coughs> Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't put my hand up. Can I start? <laughs> short answer is a, a combination. Short answer is a combination of all, but it real, this does have a. Uh, there's a longer legacy here. Um, once we uh, took took the uh, neoliberal path forty years ago, um, we had to come up with a, a way of driving the economy that wasn't productive because we used to uh, the way the economy um, the motor of the economy beforehand was productive industries and we decided to sacrifice our, our productive industries um, 
you know, we've got, a, we've got, of course, we've got mining, and, uh, et cetera, but the, the wealth, the value adding productive industries, we decided to, to you know, we didn't need those anymore. Um, and what we replaced them with is bubbles. And the biggest bubble is, is well, there's two bubbles really to identify. One is this property bubble. Um, and the other one is the, uh, is the derivatives bubble in the banks. The, the property bubble though, um, uh, is directly related to, to a government policy that you know took the neoliberal path. Um, regulators, including the Reserve Bank, and then APRA, when APRA came along, the Australian Prudential Regulation Authority, that coordinate their regulation with the Bank for International Settlements in Switzerland. And the Bank for International Settlements handles down these rules, these capital rules, which are perverse because they, they precisely encourage speculation in property, right? And the banking system gets tilted in that direction, and that's what was done. Um, they, they gave, they allowed the banks in Australia to set their own what was called risk weighting. And, and the banks said, well, we, did, we deem that, that uh, mortgages are the lowest risk loans we can make, um, whereas loans to agriculture are the highest risk loans we can make. That means the banks have to hold less capital against their mortgages and straight away they're a lot more uh, profitable for the banks. So massive encouragement to go in that direction. And this was, this was the regulator settings doing this. Um, and then the, the auditors also have a role, especially because, and this relates to the globalised nature of it, the, the, there's four big auditors globally that all audit most of the world's biggest corporations and banks. PricewaterhouseCoopers, Deloitte, Ernst & Young, and um, KPMG. They've got the game sewn up. And these auditors all gave the banks in America and Britain clean bills of health months before they all went under in 2008, yet they're never touched. And there was an inquiry into the auditors um, a few years ago in Australia, and Green Senator Peter Wish Wilson kept asking this, this very pertinent question that no one wanted to answer, who audits the auditors? Because they're not. They are, they are um, partnerships that are not obliged to, to go through the same uh, auditing process as everybody else, yet they audit all the world's companies. And they're completely discredited. So it's a failed system. And, uh, you know, the first, just like the, the first um, uh, thing an alcoholic has to do is acknowledge he's an alcoholic, acknowledge the problem before he can address it. We're going to have to acknowledge the problem. And it is all free. Um, but once you do that, then we can change it. And it just, and uh, you know, as Craig said before, you don't have to come up with new solutions, right? We've had, we had a much more functional system before we went down this path. Let's learn from that. Let's set up those systems again. I think it's also uh, helpful for alcoholics to accept a higher power, isn't it? Um, Kingsley, I think you've got something you'd like to add. Yeah, just add a little bit on to Robbie. Um, the, the, the government is really fond of creating all the stimulus and coming in with schemes that subsidise industry. Um, but what this does is just, it actually creates a false economy. It seems to be an increase in higher value transactions. But in fact, it's just inflating prices everywhere. It's not real physical economy growing. It's not the nation building as we know it. It's just creating larger and larger transactions for banks to deal in. So it again, it still looks like a bubble. If it looks, smells, feels, then it's got to be a bubble. So that's where we could be heading, particularly when the interest rate starts turning. And we're starting to see signs that in the US bond market. We're starting to see it patterns that are looking rather ominous at the moment. That's all I need to say. Okay, uh, there is another question on housing. Um, William from Cranbourne asks, I want to know how the Citizens Party would go about making housing affordable, especially for young Australians. This speculative property bubble is clearly propped up by government policy 
While the greedy banks and property speculators profiteer with the help of loose regulatory oversight, what will it take to bring housing prices down to a civilised level? Courage. <laughs> Anne. I'll jump in and have a stab here and upset everybody. Um, the thing is, either the market's going to crash or we regulate the crash in a way that we make sure that we keep people, you know, we prevent a social chaos and we prevent evictions from property. So there needs to be, I think, a, a freeze put on um, onto mortgages or debt and it needs to be readjusted. So property values will need to be readjusted down to something that is realistic. The mortgages will be readjusted down to what is um, also realistic and payable. Um, so that's going to need, uh, you know, a, a lot of stuff. You've got to deal with the, the speculation that the banks are involved in with where they derivatise the loans and bundle them up and sell them on as investments. Maybe what needs to happen is that the government needs to have a public housing policy again so that individuals are not forced to or encouraged I suppose to speculate in housing so that they can have income to fund their retirements because that's what happened we had less have public housing and and the responsibility shifted in most cases is what it does from the government onto the the private sector to do it, whether it's big corporates or in this case, whether it's mums and dads that actually have bought these houses and they're relying on rental, rental incomes and streams to be able to fund their retirement or income. And, uh, and that then puts them in competition with the younger people that are trying to also get into the housing market. So there's a lot of, um, as I say, either we regulate it and adjust it all in a controlled manner or it's going to go into a collapse and there will be chaos. Robbie. And and you, we don't, um, we're not talking about engineering a collapse uh, per se. We, the, the reality is if you take away the props to the bubble, the artificial props, it will collapse. Another, there was an artificial prop extended two days ago in the budget to expand the num the um, the uh, the number of people who can come in and take up the the, uh, the 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 latest form of the first home buyers grant, John Howard introduced the first home buyers grant in two thousand and one, and what you've had is multiple props. These the, the first home buyers grants being one of them, and these these grants were always sold as making housing more affordable. Yet every economist in the major parties knew that was a lie. Because you allow you pump more money into the market, you will push prices up and by definition make them more unaffordable, right? So it was always a scam. Take away the first home buyer's grant, take away the low interest rates. Now the low interest rates um, are assisted by the dodgy way we calculate inflation, not just in Australia, but in most of the Western world. There was a shift to the way inflation was calculated back in the 90s. And if the old method of calculating inflation was still in place, inflation would have been running closer to 10% than 3%. And under those circumstances, the central bank would, would not have been able to drop interest rates as low as they have. And if you, and if you, um, uh, uh, if, if they couldn't have the low interest rates, people wouldn't be able to afford to buy at these prices and the market wouldn't go up. And the third is the APRA, um, uh, risk weightings right this this is a regulator this is something the regulator can do they should they should recognize the danger here that's built up in the property bubble and realize hang on what they thought was the least risk is actually if they're looking at it accurately is the most risk right adjust those risk weightings up stop the banks getting away with with um not just the first home buyers but the uh, the, the investor loans that they do and pumping all this money into the bubble. And if you do that, it will come down. That terrifies governments. It terrifies people when they hear about it. But Anne alluded, we actually have a plan for that. Our plan is, is, is informed by what 
Australian governments did and what the United States government did in the Great Depression. You can keep everyone in their house. You can write down the values of the, of the property so they match, the, sorry, that you can write down the value of the debt on the property so it matches the new values of the properties, the new lower values of the properties. So the proportion of debt to, to, um, to the value of the property is roughly the same, right? And people will still will be able to afford to pay off those lower debts on those lower valued properties, but it's all relative. No one has to lose their shirt in the process. You're not gonna rescue all the investors, um, but you can make sure people stay in their homes. And this is how we stopped social chaos in the, in the uh, Great Depression, and we can do it again. America didn't do this after 2008, and they bailed out their banks and then turned around and let their banks foreclose on 12 million people. This was, such a, this was such a crime against humanity, what happened in the United States in the foreclosure wave after 2008. Go watch the movie 99 Homes if you want to see it vividly illustrated. We cannot allow that to happen. So we've got the policies for that. But yeah, you take away the artificial props, this system will come down and it'll be chaotic, it'll be traumatic, but hopefully just psychologically, because if we get our policies in place, in, within a year or so, the dust will settle and everyone will be happier because housing will again be affordable in Australia. And we should, be, we should look forward to that time. Jeff, what would you like to add? Once you unmute. Jeff, can you unmute? Uh, Jeff, you are muted. Uh, see if you can get that resolved. Perhaps you'd like to jump in, Craig. Okay, so yeah, I just wanted to jump in because one of the um, one of the issues here is that the first homeowner scheme and other government grants are effectively inflating the bubble. But I heard a report from uh, an officer of various one of the uh, institutions or one of the the, the, the um, community-based organisations that was calling for social housing. We have something we have a need for something like five hundred thousand social houses throughout Australia. So if we, as the Australian Citizens Party, would see that as a need, we would fund that, so that then you have a, a affordable rentals for people, you know. That, that absolutely need them. Instead of people on low incomes having to fork out over two thirds of their income into highly priced rental um, uh, rental costs because of the inflated housing prices, then you'll have a downward pressure. You'd have to have a downward pressure if you only allow people to pay a fraction of their income in rental that is supported by the government. This is a place the government can step in and it could be done through a national bank. We actually got a division of our national bank that could be used to fund massive expansion in social housing. 500,000 wouldn't be too difficult. This, you're, you're talking about people's lives here and you're talking about family lives. You're talking about family pressures. And when families with you know, and low incomes are paying 70% of their income just on rent, that is already a disaster in the making for those families and for those kids growing up. They're going to be deprived, they're going to be stigmatised, and therefore this would be a crucial policy for an ACP government. Let's bring, let's have a massive expansion in low-cost housing through a national bank. 500,000 sounds like a good figure. It's a big figure. And, you know, the states will most probably jump on board because usually the first thing they say, oh, who's going to pay for this? Well, if you do it through a national bank, the states will be on board real quick. They've got massive demands. I mean, I'm a bit shocked. We live in Coburg. And I've, we've been here for 30 years. We came here in 1992, 30 years ago. There wasn't beggars in the street. Now there's a beggar kneeling on every corner. And that's a bit shocking. And this is Australia we're talking about. Now, those beggars don't have housing. They sleep in the shop fronts and stuff here in Coburg. No, so the, the, the issue of low-cost social housing, of, of, of cheaper rents where people are only paying a, a, a very small proportion of their income, a reasonable proportion, but not it's not charity, but... So the disposable income is much greater. That's what we also have to look at. And I mean, there's again, plenty of history, plenty of examples in history how this was dealt with. You know, 
the Root Reconstruction Finance Corporation, again, retooled by Franklin Roosevelt, established the Homeowners uh, Loan Corporation. It, again, through the Root Reconstruction Finance Corporation, developed the finance to be able to support and buy out home loans from banks that were charging exorbitant interest rates and, and refinance these uh, homeowners into cheaper loans over a longer period at fixed repayments and saved literally millions of people from being uh, thrown out on the street. There's mechanisms here. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. All we have to do is recognise that the fight uh, is a political one and you know the, the solutions aren't necessarily going to be very nice. This has been a 40-year development of, of, of failed policies. And therefore, turning it around is going to, is going to be a bit of a, uh, as Anne was alluding to, there's going to be a bit of readjustment and it might be painful readjustment for some. We're not going to be re refinancing investors uh, in terms of any sort of um, debt moratorium or refinancing process. That's not our policy. Our policy is to keep people in their homes, yeah. keep families together, and to make sure that whatever we do, we minimise the social dislocation wherever possible. Jeff, you look like you're good to go. Yeah, all right. I uh, just want to go back to something that John Maynard Keynes said in 1945. By continuing process of inflation, governments can confiscate secretly and unobserved an important part of the wealth of their citizens. There is no sure means of overturning the existing basis of a society than to debauch the currency. The process engages all the hidden forces of economic law on the side of destruction and does it in a manner which not one man in a million is able to diagnose. If, however, a government refrains from regulations and allows matters to take their own course, essential commodities soon attain a price out of the reach of all but the rich. The worthlessness of money becomes apparent and the fraud upon the public can be concealed no longer. No. Okay. Um, so, I mean, should these policies not be implemented, we're facing an inevitable global financial crash. And of course, uh, there's plenty of concern out there and we've been fighting this issue, uh, the issue of bail-in, uh, which is a policy uh, employed to seize people's deposits in order to bail out banks in a crisis. Uh, this is this has uh, been cause for major concern. Should the banks attempt to to implement this, um, so we we have a question on bail-in that we certainly should address as part of this discussion. The uh, this comes from Anne in Darwin. The loophole has not been addressed regarding the ambiguous term any other instrument in the law that was passed here in Australia, the 2018 uh, Financial Sector Legislation Amendment Crisis Resolution Powers and Other Measures Act. Uh, and now it appears we are entering a period of hyperinflation of consumer prices uh, of the 1930s on a global scale. So how can our bank deposits be protected and what, if any, is the retribution for seized deposits. Uh, the latest issue of the Citizens Party's Australian Alert Service has a fascinating article about bail-in in, in the United Kingdom because in uh, following the global financial crisis, there was a big debate in the UK about Glass-Steagall bringing in the system to separate banks with deposits from investment banking and other speculation in order to protect those deposits. And that's the, that's the impetus of Glass-Steagall. That's the intention of it, protect depositors and their deposits. And it was a, that was the response to the Great Depression. Um, uh, and after, you know, that was in place for 66 years until they repealed it. And then a few years later, the global financial system blew up. And so smart people around the world said, well, you know, that worked, let's go back to that. But instead, the central bank has cooked up bail-in, which is the opposite of protecting deposits. We will steal deposits to prop up the system that way. Um, so they had, they, they, the City of London banks uh, rallied against the Glass-Steagall uh, 
push in the United Kingdom and they didn't defeat it, but they did succeed in watering it down. And what passed the parliament there instead was a Glass-Steagall light policy called ring fencing, where instead of forcing banks with deposits that were also had also investment banking facilities to break up and separate out as, and become completely different institutions, they said you can stay the one institution, but you've got to section off those two types of banking within your institution. You've got to ring fence the deposits. That came into force in 2019, and there's just been an inquiry in the UK that has assessed how it's gone. Um, now, the people doing the inquiry would actually like to undermine that policy and argue for a bail-in policy instead, uh, and that's that was the intention here. Nevertheless, they had to acknowledge certain aspects of how the ring fencing policy has has gone in the, the few years it's been in place, and the results are in. The banks with a, with ring fenced deposits have attracted a lot more deposits than the other banks. And they have, in, they have issued a lot more loans, actual loans, back to citizens in the community. They haven't used those deposits for gambling on speculative markets because they haven't been allowed to. And right there, you can see right now in that report in the United Kingdom, the benefit of a Glass-Steagall policy and how it does protect deposits and benefits the economy because more lending the banks do more lending back into the economy and, and issue the credit that people actually need. And even though it's not a perfect policy, give it a big tick. You want to see an example of how to protect deposits? That's what you need. You, this is why the Citizens Party, when we fought the, the bail-in law with the loophole, and we do not accept that the loophole um, is nothing to worry about, and we will keep fighting to have that loophole closed. It's not a, you know, it's not a, um, it's not a complex thing. All we're, all we're saying to the government is you're willing to tell, you're willing to reassure the citizenry of Australia verbally and in emails that you'll never bail in their deposits. Well, just go that one step further and put it in legislation, please. That's all we're asking you to do, right? Don't tell us it's not necessary. It's, it's not a big deal. And given the way you behaved when you passed the bail-in law, you rammed it through when there was only eight senators in the chamber, you didn't go to a vote which would have required a division because you knew that there were senators outside the chamber with the amendment ready to go that would have closed the loophole and you wanted to get it passed before they could pass it by your own behaviour was suspicious of your intention here. So let's, you know, cut the rubbish. Um, please, we're not going to get lit up, let up on this until we close the loophole. But once in 20, I was there in 2018 and I was on that fateful day and I was in the gallery and I watched how quickly this bill passed. Um, but then I got to go back six months later when I also sat in the gallery of the House of Representatives and watched Bob Catter get up and introduce our bill for a Glass-Steagall separation of banks in Australia. And we've got that bill there. It's been introduced twice now, in fact. Um, it's been well written. It uh, takes care of everything. If we got that bill introduced in Australia, you could rest assured a combination of that and closing the loophole, you would have very safe deposits. Short of that, or on top of that, however you'd like to look at it, let's establish a postal bank that forces the big four banks to compete for retail deposits. And everyone can know that because the postal bank is owned by the government, if you put your deposits in there, they'll be 100% safe. Okay, for those who'd like more information on our bills presented to Parliament, go to the policy section of our website. Again, citizensparty.org.au. Uh, there's a button up there for our policies. Go there and study up. Um, I'd like uh, the next question to be a little bit broader on the issue of financial corruption. Stan from Queensland uh, is asking one about culture. He says, corruption of the financial system is rife along with corruption in most other sectors of government and corporate management. I know it's a big question, but is it possible for the Australian Citizens Party or any other political group or individual to really change that culture? If so, how would you start? Craig.
we have started. It started 30 years ago. It's taking a bit of time, of course, because it's a big problem. But the key is that people have to get involved in the political fight. They can't sit back and let people simply, simply you know, do it. The other thing to recognise is we've had 40 years of neoliberal policies that have, you know, which, as John Howard said, uh, back in, I think it was 2009, I think it might have been a bit later, 2016, he basically said it was a neoliberal experiment on our economy, right? So the, the issue here is that we have allowed two generations to suffer under policies that are dehumanising themselves and the sort of leisure and the sort of um, uh, a pursuit of activities that promote and support the development of the, themselves, education and so forth, has been crushed, again, by the economic um, the pressures that come with these neoliberal, these failed neoliberal policies. So we started 30 years ago opposing these policies uh, back in, 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 the, uh, in, in the late 80s as the Citizens Electoral Council back then. Um, we've been fighting them ever since. And we've been bringing with us a, uh, uh, you know, thousands upon thousands of people across the country that understand the fight. It's not just simply an economic one, but a cultural one as well. You've got to change your ideas to what you think is important in the, na in the, in the nature of economics and in the nature of, um, uh, you, know, you know, basically what you think is important. So uh, my, my quick comment is simply say we've already started and it's working. More people are joining us. We've been able to do this uh, event tonight. As you can see, there's very high quality people involved and we're growing our organisation along the lines of the sorts of policies necessary to change the sort of crap that we've had, put up with for the last 40 years. Okay. All right, I'll move on to the next question um, regarding the cash ban. How It's from Russ Frankie in South Australia. How can we ensure that citizens who wish to use cash in their transactions are guaranteed this right with respect to all merchants? How can we ensure that no law-abiding citizen can be debanked by banks? Uh, there, is a, uh, there is a campaign to actually legislate that that uh, all merchants must accept cash as legal tender. Um, you know, accept, essentially, whatever payments they choose to accept, they should also accept cash. Uh, that is not necessarily straightforward, though. It's worth supporting, if the legislation for that is put up, it would be worth supporting. Um, there may be some constitutional issues with it. Uh, I think, though, the... the you know, let's let's uh, you know, in principle, say that that should be supported. Uh, for now, the Australian people are going to have to vote with their feet on this and actually go out of their way to use cash, um, because while the private banks are trying to get rid of it, and they are, you now they couldn't get up this bill to ban cash transactions over ten thousand dollars because we were part of the backlash that stopped that bill and defeated that soundly. Um, but they've been able to uh, reduce cash use in the economy by other means. However, they haven't been able to reduce cash demand. There's more cash demand now in the Australian economy than there ever has been. What they're doing is reducing cash use and they're doing it through encouraging some um, business chains to not use cash, uh, putting extra costs on the processing of cash and making cash harder to get. So there have been... They haven't been just shutting down branches. They've been ripping out ATMs all around Australia even faster than the branches. So um, that's what the banks would like to do. They'd like us to be purely electronic. And, of course, then they get all our data from our transactions and, and, and at a certain point they'll get a cut of all our transactions. Um, the, private, the Reserve Bank, though, has said it will support cash in the Australian economy as long as there's demand for it. So that's up to the Australian people to actually see where this is going and realise the virtues of using cash. You don't have to be, you know, you don't have to be doctrinaire about it. Obviously, there are times when it's more convenient to use a card, um, but there is a virtue to using cash. There's also a virtue to many of the, the, the small businesses to using cash in their small business because it's, 
it's um there's there's fewer government bank charges you know the, the the way the banks slug them um a lot of small businesses appreciate using cash so there's a real virtue to doing that and we should actually do it and encourage people to do it um but this is if, if you want to actually um preserve the role of cash permanently in the australian economy support the citizens party's policy for a postal bank because the postal bank would absolutely have no motivation at all to get rid of cash it would be a source of cash and it'll be a, it'll support a cash payment system and then Australians can rest assured that whatever tricks the private banks try to pull, there will always be the availability of cash in the Australian economy. And that's, we've, we've made that a centrepiece of, the, of, the, um, uh, of, of that bill. If you, don't, you know, if you don't appreciate why it's so important, go to anywhere there's been a natural disaster. Um, the bushfire areas in 2019, 20, the flood areas, et cetera, when the power fails, when the internet fails, when the communications fails and you still got to eat and you still got to transact, cash doesn't fail, right? In Lismore, our understanding is the, um, uh, the, the Woolies and, and all the other supermarkets had to put out signs straight away saying cash only. And the problem was people couldn't get cash to go in and shop. And so the big banks, which have all the resources in the world, didn't care. They did nothing to provide cash. The little operators, the little financial institutions, the little ATM operators, they actually mobilised to get cash into there. The, the post office mobilised to get cash into the flooded regions so that people could have access to cash. All right. So, um, and you'll never have a perfect world where the technology doesn't fail. So let's just put to bed this idea of a cashless society, a, you know, a cashless utopia, except we always want it and make sure we support it. Of course, a crucial part of that is the Australia Post Bank. Do we have any uh, candidates that would like to comment further on an Australia Post Bank? Anne, go for it. Well, I think just um, it pretty well speaks for itself when you think an Australia Post Bank if you've guaranteed a bank in the regions, then you're also going to be guaranteeing postal services. And the way it is that you've got all of these um, local post offices that once Christine Holgate was gone, all of the advantages that they had or the, the payments that they were receiving to do the banking on behalf of the big four banks, that's already been reduced. So what we need to do is make sure that, that if they become a government public bank, uh, you know, a post office bank, then we guarantee not only the banking services, but the postal services in those regions too. And then, of course, the savings can be directed into the, bending it out into the community, you know, um, local government can borrow through the bank to be a, and when you look at local government at the moment, they're cash strapped, they look at the disasters that they're dealing with in Lismore and places. So, it, it becomes a, um, a mechanism to, a vital mechanism for the, um, for the future of the country. Well, we have been campaigning very heavily for Australia Post Bank, so perhaps regular Joe's question is a natural follow-on. Uh, he asks, why does the Australian Citizens Party put so much focus on calling MPs? especially when they are patsies for the banks anyway. Isn't it a monumental waste of time? Anne. Well, you know, there's a lot of people that complain about government and, you know, rightly so, because, yes, they're not doing the right thing. But we have to make the government better. And the only way we're going to do that is if we keep on their case. And these members of parliament, they want to be elected. So therefore, they need to act responsibly on behalf of the people that elect them. And so we need to educate them and insist or demand that they do the right thing. And that sort of, it's like a, um, we can do so much work from the top down, but individuals need to work to stimulate and drive 
policies up through the ranks. And that's why, you know, we we ask people to be regularly in contact with their member of parliament and those members of parliament talk to other members of parliament. Then that becomes something that becomes infectious through um, through the their parties. And so that's how we've been successful with so many of our campaigns against bail-in, uh, yeah, against bail-in, against the cash ban for to get policy introduced for a national bank. So it absolutely is um, a good thing to do. Yeah, that's the bottom line. It works. That's what we've shown that in the last four years. Uh, the reason it works is because uh, politicians, very few of them, I've, uh, I've met a lot of them, very few of them I've learned to dislike. Um, they're ordinary people. But if they're in the major parties, they're part of a structure that gives them very little room to breathe. And those, the parties themselves are beholden to, best, to vested interests. And what's happened is over the decades, the Australian people have grown cynical of politics and thrown their hands up and said, you know, what's the point? What can I do? And by doing that, they've vacated the field. If, if the public, if Joe Public is not a pressure on his local politician, some other pressure will come to bear and win the day. And that's the pressure of vested interests. And what we're doing by getting people to confront politicians early and often is to force politicians to interact with, you know, find out directly what the public want. And you can't, it's, it's not something you can dictate, right? You can't say as a citizen, oh, my will as a citizen should define what happens for Australia. But if your will is legitimate, um, you will, and if it's in the democratic process and you recruit enough other people to your view, and that's what the Citizens Party does, and those politicians see a lot of people expressing the same message, it makes an impact. And then we can we get these shifts in how they look at things. And we've seen that quite a few times. Um, so, yeah, government of the people, by the people, for the people, if you think of those words carefully, the people have to do a lot of work. And if, you, if the people are just saying, oh, why isn't the system working for me, but they're not engaging in it, then don't be surprised it's not working for you. So we're trying to change that. Okay, well, um, you know, talking about cleaning up the financial corruption here in Australia and dealing with our economic problems, you have to consider the, the broader issue of the community within which Australia is a part, uh, both regionally and internationally. So it uh, would make sense to talk at least a little bit about the Belt and Road. And Sarah from Brisbane has a question. She would like to, uh, well, she says, I would really like to believe that China's Belt and Road initiative is not another debt trap like the IMF and World Bank. So as an example of a non-corrupt system, can you prove, demonstrate, or is there a track record of how countries have created credit or repaid China or whoever without usury involved? And how would the Citizens Party ensure financial corruption-free infrastructure be built here if Australia joined the Belt and Road Initiative? Kingsley. What the Belt Road Initiative does is almost be a global postal, national postal bank. It basically builds infrastructure. That infrastructure can be power plants, railways, roads, ports, and internet. These are real assets that are being created. So, and these assets are actually in location in the countries where they've been, uh, where those countries have asked those assets to be. So it's it's pretty hard to go and ask for those assets to be returned back to the people that funded it, which is China. So China has actually invested in infrastructure in places outside its own country. 
Now, this is continuing at a massive rate right across from uh, right through the Middle East and into Africa. And it's been going, for Africa, the investment's been going for many, many years. I mean, decades, absolute decades. And the Belt Road Initiative is accelerating. So I would say that most countries who are availing themselves to the funding and, and, and the support by China to build these projects aren't doing it without due diligence as to if there was something involved with uh, an unsavory corruption. Uh, there are stories written about that there are possible corruption, but I haven't seen any much evidence of that. And I don't know what the rest of the panel may want to say about it. But as I said, it's like a big postal bank, which is actually investing in infrastructure, which ultimately leaves more money left over to increase the cost of, to increase uh, the, the living standard and lower the cost of living for everyone involved. It is a, a project that is a benevolent building of, of, of a global society. And that's the way uh, most of the third world country sees it. The interesting thing is that there are a number of developed countries uh, which are actually are defying joining the Belt Road Initiative. And it will be interesting one day to see them all join and then they all can fund a Belt Road Initiative by all, many different nations for developed countries to help underdeveloped ones. I would add... I would add uh, to what Kingsley said, he's right to call it benevolent, but people might be suspicious of that. You know, why would a country like China be benevolent? Um, what's its actual interest? Well, China is a smart country that knows that it, it does very well out of trade and the richer its trading partners are, the better it will do as well. If this is win-win. China has taken ownership of this term win-win. Um, uh, it wants to. It wants the countries of Africa and Asia to be richer nations when they trade with China. That's in China's interest as well as in their interest. Um, the in terms of the corruption. Uh, first of all, understand the source of the accusations of corruption. A lot of the African countries are very bemused when they've got English newspapers writing articles about the so-called corruption and the corrupt intention behind the Belt and Road projects in Africa, because these African countries have been plundered for centuries by England, by the other countries of Europe, and they just regard it as an absolute joke um, how suddenly these, and, and they're still being plundered by Europe, by the way. European corporations, British corporations, American corporations are in there still looting Africa to death Yet the Belt and Road, their the newspapers are singling out the Belt and Road as the problem. The issue, the, 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 the abiding question is the one of a debt trap. And I've done enough work to know that that whole claim of a debt trap is absolute rubbish. And when it's Mike Pompeo saying it, and a stooge of, of the American system in Wall Street, that should be enough to tell you it's rubbish. But a lot of, a lot of academics have tracked this over time. The two examples I'll give you, there's a wonderful academic at the John Hopkins University in Baltimore, Deborah Broutigam. You can just watch her videos on YouTube, her presentations over the last 10 years. She has gone into great depth into looking at all these cases of supposed debt traps in places like Africa, and she's debunked every single one of them. And in some cases, the claims are, are, are not, not only are they made up, the, the, um, the projects that they, the way they describe the projects, et cetera, is all made up. The one that Australians are probably more familiar with is the um, uh, Hambalata, uh, Hambatoa port in Sri Lanka. And this, this was quite a, a, um, an infamous one because the Chinese government took control of the port um, because the Sri Lankan government had trouble paying its debts. But Australian academics, including at Monash University, wrote an article on this a couple of years ago where they pointed out that the overall debt problem in China, in Sri Lanka was mainly one to um, Western capital markets. And the debt and the interest on that debt was very, very high. The debt to the Chinese government for the Belt and Road was the smallest part of Sri Lanka's debt. And the interest on that debt was very low. So that was not the debt burden. 
that was crushing the debt burden that's been crushing Sri Lanka did not come from China and the Belt and Road. But China has to be um, responsible stewards with its money. And it was in China's interest and the Sri Lankan government's interest to allow a debt for equity swap, or at least temporarily, to secure those funds on that project. But nevertheless, as Kingsley said, the Chinese government can't take the port back to China. It's Sri Lanka's port and it will benefit Sri Lanka while it's there to be used. And over time, it's that it's ports like that, those kind of projects that will allow Sri Lanka to get more wealth, be a productive economy and get on top of the debt situation. And just a quick addition to that, like if this was a bad thing for these countries, you wouldn't have 130 or so countries that have signed up to the Belt and Road. You know, it's not like like China's out there holding a gun at their head and saying, you got to do this. They're willingly signing up to this because they know that there's a benefit um, for them to do that. Okay, I think we have time for one more question tonight. Uh, just firstly, I'd like to remind viewers to send questions and them. They, uh, we can ask, we can address these questions in future live streams um, and uh, by other means. But the email address ask at citizensparty.org.au. Continue sending your questions to that email address. Um, and again, unfortunately, we lost Denise Braley earlier. So any questions that are relevant to her exper expertise, we'll be sure to pass on to her as well and see if we can't get those addressed. Um, and um, I'd just like to remind people to pay attention to our, uh, our website, uh, the election part of the website, where we will announce any future events. Um, but I'll move on to the last question before we close things out. Um, we just spoke about the Belt and Road as a, a positive uh, plan for development that Australia can be a part of in uh, the broader community. But of course, as it stands right now, we're being looted by uh, many different multinational cartels. So we should address throwing those uh, off as, as part of uh, the international approach to dealing with these issues. So we've had a question from Aaron. Uh, he asks, why is so much of Australia's ability and future traded for short-term benefit? The largest income streams for Australia are only operating at a third of their efficiency. Banking, mining, farming, not to mention the secondary and extended sectors related to them, are largely owned by supranational entities that at best pay 30% tax. Why are these primary essential services and physical assets traded away instead of hard-working Australians, turning them into 100% Australian infrastructure and having the ability to, uh, to use them by Australians for a fraction of what we pay for now? Craig, would you like to start off there? This is, a, this is a big one in terms of the question, but there's a policy that comes in and has been adopted for the last 40 to 50 years in this country uh, called comparative advantage, which is the do it goes with the same doctrine of free trade. It's what you know John Howard and others brought into this country in, in, on mass through various think tanks uh, in the 70s, and then and of course John Howard was more more of an optimist in the 80s, but he he really. Uh, turbocharge this and comparative advantage means you've got to take advantage of what you've got in front of you you don't develop anything and in our case it's just simply digging minerals out of the ground and shipping them off in uh, overseas you don't bother to develop actual natural or necessary local industries you just take advantage of what's what's in front of you this is a british uh, looting policy british east india looting company it's british free trade policy and that's why that's what's underpinned our entire economic policy for the last 40 to 50 years. If you go back to the models that we've had in, in our own history into what was done during the war, we were about to be invaded by Japanese. We had to mobilise, and we did, under Curtin, Chifley, Essington, Lewis, and, uh, and of course, General Douglas MacArthur. We mobilised our economy internally by taking the resources we had, not just the physical resources, 
but also the intellectual resources. And we mobilized that through the credit of the Commonwealth Bank. That was done via the Commonwealth Bank uh, buying government bonds and then issuing credit into the necessary industries we need to prosecute the war. It was all done internally. Now, we barely had any capability of getting stuff from overseas because we we're at war in, uh, in, in the Second World War. So we were able to develop incredible richness of manufacturing very quickly. We were able to do that because we made a decision to do that and we weren't hamstrung by this external policy of comparative advantage, free trade and so forth. We used internalised uh, policies to develop our, our economy and that can be done again. It's an absolute uh, uh, shame, it's criminal that we're exporting so much of our raw materials overseas. Look at what we've done and put on our website in terms of the Iron Boomerang project, where you've got five um, you know, steel mills uh, in the Pilbara region uh, uh, drawing upon the coal from the Bowen Basin in Queensland through, a, through a, a high tech rail system across the top of the country, whereby we actually develop steel to a first stage develop steel. Now, we've got that on our website. That's the sort of policy that can absolutely develop this country. You take the fact that we're, you know, the largest uh, miner of alumina in this uh, bauxite. We should have an aluminium industry in this country to, to value add the product. Again, this is, what would, this is what would be done if we didn't have this crippling policy of free trade of, of neoliberal economics and uh, comparative advantage. So it, it's, you're right. Uh, uh, Aaron, in terms of what we've been able to do, it's been traded away for short-term gain because most of our economy for the last 40 years has been governed by international bankers. The, you know, the Bank of London uh, international financial system has moved for us from being a productive economy to a speculative one. And we've said much about this uh, uh, over the in the citizens' uh, uh, report and the various things that we do on the internet. So I'll leave it at that, but that's effectively um, what I had to say on that one. Okay, um, if that is all, we will bring this event to a close. I'd just like to remind viewers, uh, sorry, Jeff, do you want to add something in quickly? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to finish up with something that King O'Malley said in 1909, the man who was responsible for the Commonwealth Bank being brought into action. However great the natural resources of a nation, however genial its climate, fertile its soil, ingenious and enterprising its citizens, or free its institutions, if its money volume is manipulated by private capitalists for selfish ends, its credit shrinks, prices fall, its producers and business people must be overwhelmed with bankruptcy its industries will be paralysed and destitution and poverty will prevail. King O'Malley. We have a choice at the next election to create these three banks and to start to get our own destiny back into our own hands. And you certainly won't be ever be able to do that with something that the Liberal Party or the National Party, Labor or the Greens have got planned for us, that's for sure. Thank you. Yeah, well said, Jeff and King. So uh, I'd like to encourage people again to send emails, further questions to ask at citizensparty.org.au. Also get on our website, just citizensparty.org.au and order campaign flyers. Give us a call, 1800 636 432. Get those flyers out in your area. Support the Citizens Party that way and support the campaign. Um, but otherwise, uh, that will bring this event to a close. Thank you to the candidates for participating in this discussion tonight. And thanks to the viewers for your particip participation, I beg your pardon as well. And of course, for the questions asked by uh, some of those viewers as well. We will see you in the next live stream. Thank you. Good night.